Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tempest Hazel. I am the director of 16 Inches from Center, which is a nonprofit arts publication and archiving project that focuses on um, documenting and really capturing the culture of Chicago in all the corners of the city. Um, so I thought I'd start off by kind of explaining why we put this panel together. So I think one of the big reasons why we put this together is to kind of acknowledge the, um, the publishing and media, media continuum that we kind of exist within and that also my fellow panelists exist within and um, to recognize this kind of legacy of the city that's really incredible as far as like grassroots independent media is concerned. Um, we also wanted to kind of think about um, all of the different, the, the range of, of media that exists within the city and how incredibly inspiring it is. So thinking about the studs and the Chicago Defender, WHPK, WBEZ, Vocalo, um, who else do I have on my list? Uh, Johnson Publishing, Proximity, New City, um, the Chicago Reporter, all, all of these different incredible, incredible um, outlets that really provide a voice for a range of people, not just arts and culture, but all of the things that intersect with arts and culture. So um, another reason we wanted to bring these wonderful people together is to illustrate how dynamic publishing is at the moment. Um, each of these speakers and the platforms they represent don't simply publish content. They use words, conversation, and public thought as a starting point to then galvanize people and um, to illuminate the beauty and the bruises of our city and our country in really interesting ways. Um, so I'm going to introduce the panelists. Uh, so Tracy Bame is a publisher and executive editor of Windy City Times, which if you don't know, it's a weekly LGBTQ newspaper, which she co-founded in 1985. And it's one of the longest running, correct me if I'm wrong, longest running LGBTQ papers in the city, definitely, but also in the country. Um, let's see. And it, it runs in both print and online, which I find to be extremely Yay. incredible. <laughs> uh, it's, and it's pretty legendary. The publication and its founder have, been, have won numerous awards. And I also find it interesting that Windy City Times has been incorporated into countless exhibitions that I've, I've seen it and stumbled upon it on the walls of Gallery 400 and most recently um, Alphawood and also um, in the work of different artists, it's been incorporated, which I find really wonderful. Um, right next to me is Andrea Hart, which is one of the founders of City Bureau. If you don't know about City Bureau, you probably actually do. Um, <laughs> it's a civic journalism lab that has partnered with several publications across the city to deliver some incredible investigative journalism. Um, their award-winning work is responsible for some recent articles and projects that have been really dear to me and important to me. Um, one being living with lead, and the most recent being an investigation into police presence in Chicago public schools, which is, we can talk about that, <laughs> how great that is. Um, Alex Cox won't be able to join us. Uh, she had a family emergency, so she had to um, take care of that. But I will read her uh, bio and introduction just so you know who she is, and maybe you'll be so curious as to kind of check out what she does. So Alex Cox is a senior producer at Cards Against Humanities and also co-hosts the podcast Roboism, Do By Friday, and Refresh. She also co-founded Post Loudness, which is the reason why I asked her to be on the panel. Post Loudness is a collective of audio shows by uh, people of color, women, and queer identified hosts. 
And I really, I really love them because some of, some of their, some examples of the podcasts that they do in their taglines include um, open-ended, two best friends b blurring the lines between fiction and facts, Roboism, a show about robots and feminism, but mostly robots. <laughs> Unlearned, a show about challenging narratives of blackness, womanhood, sexuality, and religion with equal parts petty and progressive. So you should check out Post Loudness. The websites are up here. Um, also, oh, so this conversation will be moderated by the one and only Lee Bay, which is one of my favorite, all time favorite storytellers. Um, and he makes me wish I wrote the Metra a lot more um, <laughs> for, for reasons. Um, he always has the best Metra stories and meets the best people on the Metra. He's a respected writer and photographer of the built environment who holds um, all of the fascinating knowledge about our city's urban design, community development, and architectural preservation issues. Over the years, he's worked as a critic for the Chicago Sun-Times, producing his own show for Rivet Radio, appearing on countless TV news stations like WTTW, and serving as deputy chief of staff for architecture and urban, urban planning under Mayor Richard Daley. And before I turn it over, I also want to take a moment to say a word about um, two panelists that were going to be here but won't be here, and that's Ed Marzuski and Logan Bay of Lumpen Radio. Um, a few weeks ago, Logan was in a really um, pretty terrible accident, and he's currently recovering. Um, Ed started a campaign for him that raised over $60,000 in a few weeks to help him with his medical bills, which is pretty incredible. And then um, uh, Ed said that he couldn't be here because he's taking up the slack of uh, while Logan is recovering. So I did want to do a shout out for them because Lumpen yeah. is very near and dear um, to 60's heart and they've been a big supporter of us since we started. So I'll now kind of, I'm, I'm going to sit on the panel. I wasn't originally going to do that, but I'll sit on the panel with you. I'm Tempest Hazel. I am, I am the founder of 60 Inches from Center and currently the director. Um, yeah, so I'll sit, I'll sit up here with you since we're missing some, some beloved people. And if you happen to have questions for me, but I'll just eavesdrop on the conversation and pass it on to you, Lee. You know, I certainly will ask you questions. I've been <laughs> waiting for this day, and now they got cameras and microphones to record oh, it. Oh, no. <laughs> I have a special set of uh, questions. Uh, but no, thank you very much for coming. And, and um, as, um, as, uh, as Tempest clearly indicated, we're looking for a robust conversation here with these two great, three great panelists. And then um, at some point, I'll open the floor up to Q&A, so hopefully there's some Q uh, for them to A uh, uh, before the <laughs> day's over. Um, but let me just jump in. One thing I wanted to ask is, um, you know, there's a, obviously a lot of opportunity, right, uh, now that didn't exist through technology and other ways to get these messages and get these, and, and get these stories out. But the audience is also very fractured. It's like it was back in the old days mm. when I was in mm. the Sun Times and we could claim 500,000 readers. Um, now that audience is split up, divided up in many ways. How do you um, generate audience. Um, start with, uh, with Andre. With me? Mm -hmm. um, I guess I don't necessarily think they're any more fractured than they were before. I think mm -hmm. I disagree with that. I think that it was easy for the Sun Times and things like the Tribune to say that they had the reach just because they were kind of distributing without really worrying about what was coming back to them. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say that a lot of the circumstances that have humbled the journalism industry have made them be a lot more honest about their community engagement and how they work with their audience and serve their audience. And that's why with City Bureau, community engagement and the, the public that we serve is at the center of what we do. So when we are coming up with story ideas, we, we do a lot of community engagement work around that to try to get, get authentic or accurate um, story ideas, especially since we're focusing on the south and west sides of the city. And it's also why we host a weekly workshop series out of our space. And we have this documenters network uh, where anybody of any age range can apply to kind of become a freelancer with us because those are means of creating community as well as engaging community around the work that we're doing. This is good. I got, I got 100 questions on that piece alone. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll keep it down the front. Uh, Tracy, get in on this. 
Well, you know, I feel like we, so we were founded in 1985. I was 22 years old, and I don't think I've ever known anything except community-based journalism. Mm -hmm. I wasn't allowed in the mainstream, mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad they didn't have me, because mm -hmm. none of my friends who worked in the mainstream in 1984 when I graduated college are still in media. Mm -hmm. um, I'm nearly the only one in my journalism class that is actually still doing journalism. <laughs> um, and it's what I've wanted to do since I was a young kid. So them telling me I couldn't be openly gay and be at the Tribune, um, in 1984 actually was a blessing. And so for me, the community engagement part of journalism has been a natural the entire time we've been around. Not all gay media are like that. I'm not saying that just because we are LGBT media. All LGBT media engage with their communities like we do, but we have in part, I think because I'm a feminist as well and I um, wanted our paper to be as egalitarian as possible for the whole time, meaning we never just covered one segment of the LGBT community, we always covered many segments. In fact, for 10 years we operated um, two publications one Black Lines and one En La Vida that were specifically African American LGBT and Latino LGBT. Talk about we can't get money for ads in LGBT paper. <laughs> Those papers were a labor of love and lost money every single issue. Um, and they were in print form. So we very much engage with our community and finding that niche of readers is actually made much easier because of the internet. When the internet came along, we were actually really, I was really happy because I've come from a journalism side, not from the business side. And I always saw, since we're a free paper, everything we've ever done is free. So the in, on, online didn't scare us. We're like, oh my God, more free. <laughs> we can put more of our content online. So we do, every week we put twice as much online as we do in our print paper. We consider our weekly print paper kind of the curated version of the most important, especially local LGBT stories, news and, and culture of the week. Um, and then we can put everything else online uh, for archival history, people can find it. Um, so we, our readership has grown immensely because of the internet and so finding our readers especially through targeted social media is actually easier than ever before we have 400 distribution outlets of our newspaper we print 10,000 copies a week but we have 30,000 unique visitors a week online we have 15,000 on Facebook 19,000 on Twitter 1300 on Instagram that's so much more than we could have reached 20 years ago that it's very exciting to be a niche publication now the many free ways we can get out there that don't cost us as much as print allow us to have an expanded reach without the expanded cost. Mm -hmm. You know, and I guess let's, I should probably step back one step, a half step, just to help add some context to this because we can't stress this enough, is that the, the communities that you, that you speak to and write about, um, South and West Side, and, and the, and uh, I'll, I'll never get all the initials right now that the <laughs> microphone is on me. <laughs> nope. I'm Lee, just say queer. The queer yeah. community, all right. Yeah, <laughs> there, you I, go. there you go. There you go. Help. That's Alpha, I, I was getting off of this group, so I'm on. That's good. Uh, but but, but these, are, these are communities that, were not, not, that are not only overlooked, but when they are written about, were written about, are written about, are often written about. I was watching a documentary on Harvey Milk, just, just you know, that's, and Harvey Milk died within my life, my lifetime. And I was shocked after uh, to see, in my, in my lifetime, I think the 70s were more enlightened than they really were. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and I feel the same way, obviously, about the South and West Side. I, mean, I live in the South Side. So what I, I guess what I want to step back and get you guys to talk about is, you know, these are communities that are overlooked and stereotyped. So right. how do you get into that and, and, and change report? Talk about that a bit. Yeah, why don't you go ahead. Um, I mean, you show up. I think that you show up not just when bad stuff is happening, and that's sort of what we've been doing um, consistently. And I think even so, there's four co-founders of City Bureau, and each of the four of us, and particularly Daryl and myself, Daryl Holiday, who was a former DNA info editor, me and me working in a youth media education background, we were showing up every day in those areas and had built those relationships with community groups. Um, so I think for us a lot of it is asking them what they want and what they want to see and then also the kinds of information they need and then we're going from there and I think that's been really helpful for us um, having that because we had been showing up consistently previously not just when bad stuff was happening. Um, and then now we're sort of talking about, well, okay, so we recognize the value of what you're doing in whatever work you're doing and that there's a more holistic approach to covering some of these issues mm -hmm. and there's also a better way to make accountability accessible and I think that's the other, the other piece that has sort of allowed us to move really quickly and build relationships, even more relationships outside of the ones that we've had. 
-hmm. Tracy? Yeah, I mean, obviously I come at it myself being a lesbian, but there's so many different parts of the LGBT community mm -hmm. that the challenge is making sure that those different parts of our community are covered well. And um, how do, you do that because it really isn't a, obviously it's not a monolith. How, how do you right. how do you piece that out in a way to? Well, we're lucky. We have 52 issues a year, mm -hmm. and then online. So we have a lot of space to do the community right. We don't do it. We can't do it perfect, mm -hmm. but that we are constantly trying to stay ahead of certainly the news side of it, but also the controversies within our community. Mm -hmm. There's certainly a lot of racism within our community. There's transphobia within our community. There's a learning curve for lots of parts of our community about other parts of our community. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and so that makes it difficult. Like for a period of time, we had a, a, like the first six months, I think of 2015, there was a tremendous amount of specifically trans news that was breaking on it. We, were, we did a big investigation of Cook County Jail and a trans woman who was in jail. That series ran for a while and then we had a bunch of other breaking news and we got a little pushback. Mm -hmm. from parts of the community said, why are you only covering trans stuff? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if you read each issue every week, most of the stories, not only in any one issue, have every part of our community, but a lot of the stories are for all of us. So if we're doing a story on LGBT rights, or um, you know, th there, there's a review of a theater play, you know, play or something, mm -hmm. you can't really peg those as one or the other. Mm -hmm. But when you have dominant stories, mm -hmm. people are going to stereotype it. We even did a series, a huge year-long series on the status of AIDS and HIV in the community. I had gay men tell us we were doing too much on AIDS. Mm -hmm. So really, what I tell people, and when people say you don't cover something, like older gay men or something, I say, well, I'm going to point you to the stories, but I want you to not take any one issue of our paper and say we don't cover X, Y, Z because I can rattle it off for you for the last 30 years, <laughs> what we've been doing in almost every segment of our community. But it is difficult. I mean, to me, it's about resources. We have you know, a limited amount of, we have a lot of freelancers, and then we have four of us full time that write or edit. Mm -hmm. So there is a limited amount that many people can do. And so we really try very hard to do the unique stories in our community more than we would do the traditional stories of here's a long time couple. Like that's a story we do, but the mainstream likes those better, right? They're easy access to the gay community. Right. They do, I'm not saying it's lazy or anything. I'm saying mm -hmm. whenever they're covering different communities that aren't the traditional straight white man kind of thing, they fetishize it sometimes, they stereotype it as all one or the other, and if you're only doing a few stories a year, it is really hard to make it a diverse sampling of, let's say you were doing stories on the disabled community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The same would be true if you did three stories on the disabled community this year, you are not going to represent the disabled community. Right. Mm -hmm. But in 52 issues in print and 365 days online, we feel like we cover as much of that community as we can. Part of it is having writers from different parts of those communities. Part of it is sponsoring events, going to events, going, you know, I was just in Downers Grove yesterday <laughs> speaking, you know, all over the region where you can then find great stories. Yeah. And, and that is, that's really, the, the, there's no trick. Yeah. I would love to know the addresses of all the reporters at the Chicago Sun-Times and Tribune. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. where you live is what you know best. Right. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's part of the problem. Yeah, and I think Andrew? something else that she's getting at that I think is also really important is creating newsrooms that look that look that include folks that have experiences of those who are writing they're writing about because within city bureau like our fellowship we prioritize that one of the thing pillars or the things that we try to attack is the lack of inclusivity in newsrooms mm -hmm. and be, and i think that when you start opening up those spaces you naturally start building trust because people see that you're telling those stories more completely Sort of to get at what Tracy was saying. This is this is a good point. I want to I want to double back on that in a, in a minute or two. One thing I did want to ask you about both of you um, is the level of, of activism that that you do. I mean, um, you know, not only in your personal lives, but but it, within the business model of, of what what you operate. Right. Um, that 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 you guys, particularly both of you, but you, you guys in particular, you you actually have community meetings with your audience. I mean, that's almost, yeah. that was an anathema back, you know, it, it still is, it was yeah. in the mainstream um, uh, papers. And of course, on Tracy, I've crossed paths many times on, on issues, particularly uh, in a positive way, cross paths, I should say, uh, particularly uh, tiny homes and, and other things. Um, why is that important, but isn't that risky? There, that, that separation that old media likes, mm -hmm. um, there's a reason sometimes why they can articulate, there's a reason why it's there, but you guys are blurring it. So talk about that a bit. 
So I think for us, we consider ourselves organizers and not activists. And because we do think that part of journalism is organizing folks around information and accountability. And I think that's, and that's part of it being a public good. And I think that's really true to the definition of journalism. Uh, in my personal life, I, I guess I could be considered an activist, but I just think I'm, I want things to be fair. And I know for some folks, that seems crazy, the things that I want to be fair. Um, but anyway, but yeah, so I think for us, it's really, we really look at, like, we think it's important, it, sort of given the lack of trust that certain people have, and it's a rightful lack of trust of media in the city, knowing that to be true, knowing sort of all the barriers of entry to become a journalist and also the barriers to access information, we have to think about how do we organize the, the information that we share and how do we get the information that we share given those things to be true. Mm -hmm. um, which I guess to some people is seemingly radical, but then I'm like, where, where do you live? Like, do you live in Chicago? Are you aware of how segregated the city is and, the, and the, how that has manifested? Because if you are, then what we're asking is to undo some of that, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Tracy? Yeah, I would say journalism made me an activist. Um, mm -hmm. And it, for, two, for two reasons. One is I saw my mother working at, when I was very young, she worked at the Chicago Tribune and they wouldn't let her cover news. So she was forced out of the Chicago Tribune in the late 60s and she went to work for the Chicago Defender. Before that, she had worked for the United Mortgage Brokers of America for Dempsey Travis, mm -hmm. who was fighting redlining. She covered Martin Luther King in Birmingham, right? She blurred lines more, as much as uh, I do, if not more. Um, she even interviewed Castro in the mountains of Cuba before the revolution. Um, and so she was kind of that advocacy journalist. Um, she didn't. I may cross a little bit differently than her, but we, she did. She crossed those lines before me, and I, I consider her a role model. And um, the other way it made me an activist was because in college, in journalism classes, when they said you, you know, there was such a thing as objectivity, and I knew that was not true, it by default made me an activist. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, well, I'm a lesbian, I don't think that's wrong, therefore you're saying I can't be a journalist, well, I'm going to be. And that was my first basic lesson that uh, journalism was not some wonderful objective pie in the sky thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I have many examples over time. Well, first of all, I started covering the gay community in the cr middle of a crisis of a war on our community with going to funerals every few days for people who were dying of HIV and AIDS complications. So if you're not a human, <laughs> Maybe robots could have covered that yeah. and not, not had an empathy and an activist born out of them from that. And the same is true with the murders of trans women of color these days and other violence and legislative violence against communities. So I, I give one example of how I got into, for example, tiny homes for the homeless, which we're advocating for and we have a model up in back of the yards right now and hope to have a model community up within the year. Um, we did a series very objective series, right? As objective as you can be, where we did a, um, on the racism on Halsted Street around youth who were homeless. Mm. It was a three month investigation. We sent our three t a team of three reporters out to do interviews. At the end of the series, we came up, at the last of the series was a series of recommendations right. from the youth. The youth said, these are things that would help our lives short of housing. Great list, right? Nothing happened. <laughs> Not one agency asked us for our data. Oh, you know, we interviewed over 100 youth. Nobody wanted to see it, nobody did anything. So uh, about a year later, we did a uh, conference with youth. We paid them for their time. We created a 70-page document out of it and we launched an organization called Pride Action Tank. And out of that summit, um, another organization started too called Chicago Youth Storage Initiative. We've put almost 300 lockers into uh, shelters and drop-in centers because youth said that would make their lives easier. And we're activating tiny homes, we're activating all these things. And I felt compelled to start these things because nobody else was doing them. And who am I as a journalist uh, to take the time of a subject, interview them, have solutions right in front of me. Mm -hmm. And if yeah. nobody else is taking them up, I have a sense of obligation, if I can, to advance that mm -hmm. in the lockers and the tiny homes and other things we've done out of it, including getting laundries into the shelters. We got five washing machines and dryers donated. All that stuff is because I, I'm 
journalist slash human. Yeah. Forget activist. And, and if I can, after 33 years of doing this, I have some connections where I can get stuff done, um, I feel obligated to. I can't do everything, but if there's something, you know, one leak you can stop, <laughs> um, then that I feel like an obligation to that. And as a publisher, I have a little bit more luxury than maybe as a, one of my reporters would do with that. They would have a different um, barrier to, to act, acting yeah. on that. Yeah, and this, I interviewed Tracy for this research I'm doing for Democracy Fund about the healthiness of Chicago's media ecosystem, and what you're saying also reminds me of, some of it is also, if you live long enough, you go from being an activist to just being sort of moderate, because I feel like there were things that you mentioned when I talked to you that you had done in the 80s that were then like conceived as very activist and are now more centered when it comes to media coverage. And I also think of Jamie Calvin when I think of that example. You know, at, some, at one point, the city was trying to ruin this man mm -hmm. by filing subpoena after subpoena and to like, like financially bury him. And now they've come around and are asking him, how can we reform police accountability? And literally, it's just because Jamie lived long enough to see that happen. This is a fantastic point. Actually, it's something I want to ask you about, so we can nest here a bit. But for, wait, before we get to that, let me, let me get Tempest in, who's, <laughs> who's, uh, who's I, I don't want to get left out. Now, you know, we, I don't feel left out. I'm loving this. You're not, okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah. But, but I did have a question for you. So, I'm one, you know, so as we talk about this, as we think about things that are overlooked, certainly uh, arts and culture in, in, uh, in communities of color are often overlooked or treated uh, media-wise as kind of a drive-by, uh, you know, a flyover kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. But there's rich, you know, uh, you know, in these communities, you know, the culture didn't stop when, when, when people stopped playing blues. I mean, I mean, these communities are still creating mm -hmm. art and culture and all these kind of beautiful things, and, and you're able to shine light on that. Talk about that a bit. <laughs> oh, you better. Talk about what do you what, do what you, you see? Talk about what you see coming out of these communities, maybe overlooked by uh, mainstream media, but are, but, are, but, are, but are now being talked about in channels such as yours and, and outlets such as yours and other places. Hmm. Well, I, th I think one of the one of the things that technology allows is for a new kind of re relevance and visibility. So it's hard for me. Like I, I feel like I'm always tweaking the language that 60 uses because the margins. You know, you kind of have to you you kind of have to specify what those are margins of, mm -hmm. or you know what what it's under um, what the lack of visibility like to what audience is it mm -hmm. not visible to so mm -hmm. we kind of grapple with that and so a lot of who who and what we cover and what we see and the writers and the artists that we um, promote are it's our audience are each other. Mm -hmm. So we're already kind of aware of what it is that we're doing. It's not like we're discovering anything. We're just really kind of taking a step, one step to the right and seeing the people who are surrounding us all the time and yeah. just figuring out ways to um, put it to words or capture it in some way. See, I, I like that answer because, um, you know, so I photograph architecture and one of the things that I struggle with sometimes when I post or print or publish a, a, a photograph, someone will say, oh, it's, you've discovered this building on the corner of 63rd and something. <laughs> Blankety blank has been there since 1920. I knew it was there. Yeah. You, do, you know. Yeah. But so, so, but, so, how do you? But I, I like your answer because you kind of get out of the interesting thing that that there's a fine line or interesting line between giving life to people who know and saying, look, mm -hmm. I, I know you know about 63rd and Halstead. Here's a building on 67th and Halstead. Check this out. Um, and uh, or as opposed to the idea that you're 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 that someone is being discovered. I can't quite frame the question as well. Like your Columbus but covering. I was trying not to say that, which I'm totally right, which I'm totally right. Yeah, that, and, and covering that, that there's, a, there's a line between, is there a line between, uh, you know, giving life and attention to something that deserves to be, and then the risk of it, of, of, of um, what the hell am I talking about? I don't know. You, 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 <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I think that we, um, it depends on audience. I, I always, mm -hmm. I go back and forth about who, who we're doing the work for, mm -hmm. and I think we're doing it. We have, I don't, I don't want to say a hierarchy of audience, but I do want to say a hierarchy of audience. And our primary audience is our own community and our own kind of ecosystem that we work with then, but then we also acknowledge the fact that 
um, our audience is also people outside of that or um, or with the archival work, it's targeting people doing the research or um, uh, historians or other artists or curators or you know people who may be looking for things outside of what is um, easily found for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So it's it it's a bit of a a mix. So discovery, yes, some people might find the content on that we produce. They might find something that they've never they they never knew existed, mm -hmm. but then most of the people reading are reading because they're like, "Yes, I've been to a, you know like six or seven shows of that person, and I know that person really well, and I just want to learn more." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of the, a lot of our audience are already familiar with the people that we're um, that we're highlighting. They're just maybe their discovery is discovering more about that artist. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. I'm going to get to, get to a Q&A um, in probably another two minutes. I, I wanted to get back to, to a thing you mentioned about, about the barrier to journalism. Yeah. You know, um, so I'm, I, was, I, grew up, I was born in 70, 73rd and Kimbark, went to Chicago Vocational High School, grew up blue collar, mm -hmm. I went to Columbia College in the 80s. I think, I think my, my student loan when I left there was $50.51 a month. Yeah, I worked, oh I worked at the post office and put myself through college largely yeah. and got a job at the city news bureau, the old city news bureau. Yep. And within a few years, three years, I was, I was at the Sun Times. Um, my, for, my, my education was cheap and my pathway was pretty direct. Yeah. Um, that fell away as, you know, those, the, the, link, the bridges, the links in the, in the ladder that I was walking across falling away behind me. But what you, what you're able to do is sort of, uh, begin to sort of put those things back. Uh, mm -hmm. talk, talk about that a mm. bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I fortunately like grew up, it's like funny, it's always funny to say that, uh, largely raised by a single mother, lo very low income. So I got paid to go to Northwestern because I was poor and smart. And so I walked away graduating in 2009 when the crisis really hit journalism <laughs> without debt, uh -huh. walking in, into an industry that I thought I was gonna get paid to work in. Um, Anyway, but yeah, and I think seeing that and sort of, I, I originally was like, oh, it's Northwestern, you know, like I, I bought into that mm -hmm. narrative a little bit when I was, when I was going there. Mm -hmm. and, I, and now I'm like, no, it's total bullshit. And journalism is a public good. And when it is, a, is as a public good, it should be accessible for folks. And knowing that, um, and knowing that anybody should be able to do it because you're supposed to be asking questions then, okay, what does that look like? So for us, yeah, we, we have the fellowship where we kind of onboard folks into Chicago a little bit um, and also like create these teams where some more experienced freelancers are mentoring ones who might still be in college, have no journalism experience whatsoever. Um, and they, there's an exchange that happens there. In addition to that, we also have um, other entry points that I mentioned earlier, like the public newsroom, the documentaries, just because we want to see, you know, who is out there and who has an interest in bettering their community and documenting their community and then amplifying that in a way that, again, makes accountability accessible. And so, and so ideally, the way it works is like folks kind of come, come and work with us as a documenter, they get some training, they move into a fe the fellowship position, and then from there, we have had fellows go into media you know, one of them was hired by the Chicago Reporter. One of them was actually hired by one of the youth media organizations that we mentor. Um, so it is happening. We do see it happening, and it's great. And then in one instance, you know, some of the fellows started their own online um, space, 90 Days, 90 Voices, to document what's happening in the immigrant community the first 90 days of He Who Shall Not Be Named. <laughs> and so I think that, you know, um, and so what's happening is like you know it's 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 allowing folks to create those pipelines because we we have one ourselves um, because there is value and it's like approaching folks from a not a, not being deficit based when you're looking at like oh what's your pedigree mm -hmm. you know what's your background because that you know that affects the product right I mean right. If, if everyone who if, if if the only people who can afford a journalism education are people with uh, long waspy last three three last names and uh, and come from uh, from privileged backgrounds. It affects what what gets what, what gets right. printed. Yeah. Right. And we we um we've always had non journalists as journalists at our paper. My managing editor didn't get a journalism degree. My I think one of my two reporters has a journalism degree. The other is a 
um, a transgender woman that was coming out of um, nonprofit world and wanted to, you know, had barriers um, because of employment barriers trans people face, but is a phenomenal reporter. Um, to me, it's that natural curiosity and can you write a sentence? We can edit the sentence, mm -hmm. um, but can you, you know, so there's some natural traits you do need to have and I always say curiosity is the number one th thing I want you to have mm -hmm. about other people, not yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and we have had youth who are experiencing homelessness write for us, take photos for us, um, tell their stories in different ways. Um, cra uh, this one youth who experienced hell on earth in a foster care um, scenario wrote a series of columns about that for us and we paid for that. So we do try to um, have different kinds of voices in the paper. It, the, the challenge on editing is definitely hard, yeah. um, but it's worth it when you get those unique voices in there. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, I see some curious faces in the audience. I'm hoping there's some <laughs> questions behind that. Uh, I'd like to, at this point, um, open the floor up to questions from the audience for, to this esteemed panel. Yes. You know, we won't always be around. I tell my staff this, um, we are advertiser based. Online advertising for a niche publication like us, it, it, it doesn't even support the website. Like we can't, we could not even put the website out if we were relying on the ads that are on that website. Um, New York Times maybe can, Buzzfeed maybe can, but not us. So our model is almost all advertising based. We have gotten very few foundation grants, but some foundations are starting to do grants to for profit journalism. I mean, the Los Angeles Times got a half million dollar grant from the mm -hmm. Ford Foundation. Um, but our, again, our little papers are hardly getting any of that money. That's a transformative grant for a small publication. That's nothing for the New York Times. So we are looking to see how those things can, you know, sustain us into the future. We have done promotional events. We do, you know, various things that bring in some revenue. But 95% of our money comes from print advertising. Hmm. So we're in alliance with other top LGBT papers across the country. In fact, next week we have one of our, we meet twice a year together with all the publishers and go over uh, ways that we promote ourselves together nationally to the national corporate brands. Um, and then we also have team sales reps locally and I as publisher sell um, a lot too, I hate it. Um, but I do that whatever I can to get revenue to pay the bills. Um, five years ago I was saying, I don't know if we'll be around in five years, but we're here. Um, and we could be around another five years, it could be another two years. It's entirely dependent on the younger and younger people making decisions about where they're putting their advertising dollars and also corporations that should be committed to community-based media that they shouldn't put 99% of their money on to, at Facebook um, and they need to look to, so we kind of have an activist approach to corporations and their they should be setting aside percentages of their marketing to the African-American mar market, the Latino market, mm -hmm. Asian market, LGBT market overall um, and that's something that I think that we as consumers can pressure um, because we can't lose these community-based media. I'm not saying my papers that be all and end all, but all of us together, including City Bureau and other ones, are very important um, to um, not having this monolithic voice of, of uh, corporate America only supporting that one model. So I don't know, I, I really don't know how long we'll be around, but um, I, it's certainly been a privilege to do it this long, so I'm not gonna be greedy, but for my team, my younger team members, um, I hope that we can be around in this form as long as possible. And uh, City Bureau, we do a mix of funding. So we have, we do get foundation funding. We also do a series of, we have like a series of consulting projects. We tend, so we get a lot of money actually through consulting for various things that each of the four co-founders do. And then we do get a lot of public funding. And so part of what we're trying to figure out is to do more of a membership drive for us because it makes sense. I think in a lot of ways, um, I think if you can show folks the value of what you're doing locally, I'm not really speaking to national outlets because I don't really care how they get their money, but um, I do think on a local level, if you can show a value, folks will pay for it. 
Um, and so just figuring out what that looks like. You know, we're fortunate that like we get to pay all of our fellows, our documenters, we pay everybody um, except for the co-founders. But I mean, until recently, thankfully, myself and Daryl are now full-time uh, at City Bureau. But um, yeah, but I think that membership is one thing that we're really trying to think about. And we are experimenting with other things, um, talking to Center for Investigative Reporting in California around what does it look like for an outlet to also have a business behind it, um, things like that. But I do think that there is a little bit of onus on foundations when it comes to those that fund media, that they should kind of allow some breathing space and really be thinking about how do they do training around sustainability? Like they throw that word out there a lot, like how, show us how you're sustainable or what are your, what's your sustainability plan? But in a lot of instances, they're talking to journalists. They're not talking to folks that are, have business degrees or understand that world. And so I think because they're so immune to the financial market changes, they should really be taking a little more ownership of that. I mean, we're fortunate with City Bureau because one of our four co-founders is a business person, and I think that's why we've been able to be so successful um, in, in only under two years of existing. But yeah, I do think that there's a little bit of onus on foundations there. And did your initial money come, some of it, come through Kickstarter, right? Yeah, so we did. We had a really successful Kickstarter campaign in the fall, and that really helped us launch and launch both the public newsroom series that we do every Thursday and really get the documenters program out off the ground. And now the documenters program, because a lot of it is training folks to cover public meetings, we do get contracts for that. So mm -hmm. city agencies have contracted us um, and others because people do want to pay um, that, that work is of value to like create a living archive and there are folks that will pay for it. Very good, very good. Other questions from the audience? You guys. <laughs> Talk about this a bit, and I guess we've got about, about, about 10 minutes left. Do we have uh, Tempest? I should be watching the clock better. Yes, <laughs> about 10 minutes. About 10 minutes, all right. Um, I, can, I believe you, we can, we may resort to song and dance, but we're gonna get these 10 minutes done, all right? <laughs> um, the, you have shaped each of you, um, um, each of your organizations and, 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 uh, and organizations like, like yours, um, whether the mainstream media wants to sort of admit it or not, you've really shaped and, 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 and helped push them to perhaps cover some issues that they probably wouldn't cover. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start with Tracy since she's mm. closest to me. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, we covered many a protest against the Chicago Tribune and, and sometimes in the 1980s mm -hmm. when they were really horrible on covering gay stuff and, and AIDS in the communities. Um, and you know, the we forget about that. Can you remember an example of how horrible uh, uh, they were then? Oh, the Tribune ran a series on homosexual pedophilia uh, as late as the late 1970s. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the New York Times uh, treated gay men um, really, I mean, it, during the AIDS crisis, was, it was all about scare tactics and, and uh, you know, they would always feel like you did a story on gay people, you have to quote horrible people mm -hmm. against them. And in Chicago, it was Reverend Hiram Crawford. Um, they always had to get a quote saying, we are going to hell, we're sinners, all this stuff. So. And, and they did a story on Harold Washington once, Mayor Harold Washington, where the reporter, you know, did the story and the editor inserted in there rumors about Harold Washington being gay mm. as a way to demean the mayor. Mm -hmm. And that they were definitely intentionally doing it. They weren't doing it out of any great, mm -hmm. he's wonderful because he's gay. They were absolutely doing it as an attack on him. And an editor inserted that in the Chicago Tribune mm -hmm. in the late 19, in the mid 1980s. So we were coming up, we, the reason the LGBT press even was founded was out of the horrors of calling us perverts in headlines and uh, outing people that were arrested at gay bars who would lose their jobs or custody of their children and some people killed themselves. I mean, that's the reason the gay press started. Mm -hmm. When in the late 80s um, and early 90s, when mainstream press started getting a little better, I thought, oh, we're gonna be going away soon mm -hmm. because they have a gay beat reporter. And it was only half time. Both of them had half time gay beat reporters, mostly because of AIDS crisis. And they were great reporters. They were starting to do really, really good stuff. But they were pulled off that within a couple of years. And I was like, well, they're, they're not going to cover us as well if they don't have someone dedicated to it. And then, of course, the crisis in mainstream media comes around. And most, 
I mean, they're gutting newsrooms. So their, their ability to be diverse internally and cover externally diverse communities is less than it's been in 30, 40 years yeah. because they're losing voices that could represent that and they don't have the space to cover the true diversity. So I feel like the niche media are more needed than ever before yeah. because they're not doing their jobs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Andrew? I forgot what the question was because I just love listening to Tracy. <laughs> um, how, <laughs> how your organization in particular, organizations like your, yours in general, have <laughs> pushed the mainstream media uh, oh, yeah. recovery issues they haven't? I mean, yeah, part of what we like to, we consider ourselves as like part disruptor, part repairer. Um, and part of that is, you know, getting the stories that our fellows cover. You know, for the, the first year and a half of City Bureau, our first year, we covered police accountability and we didn't tell a single crime story. And, but the, that work did get published in local outlets and national outlets. Um, so part of it is to kind of like stick ourselves in, into those spaces and be like, this, and they paid us for that, you know, they paid us for that coverage. Um, so there is, there, to remind them that there is a value there um, and that also folks want to consume those things. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's one layer of it for us. Where do you see, and, and I'm going to say, Tracy, you will be around in five years, <laughs> uh, and if not 10, where, where, where do you see yourselves either uh, personally, professionally, or, or your, your, your media outlet, where do you see yourselves uh, in, in five years? which is an eternity these days. It is an eternity. And you know what's interesting for me? So I'm 54, and I've made dirt in journalism for the last 33 years, <laughs> right? I don't have, I, I fortunately have a house we're about to sell that hopefully will get me some cushion. But um, I actually feel like one of the things I could do of most value to my paper is to pull myself off of the paper <laughs> and to take a job in a, in a youth homeless nonprofit or something like that in a field that I'm really doing a lot of work in anyway as a volunteer and allow my paper to um, not have my salary on it, which again is only $20,000, but it's $20,000, right? And I'm thinking, well, I could get a job elsewhere and then that gives my paper a little more freedom uh, economically. I would still work for it as, that, that would be my hobby and another job would be my job. I would like kind of reverse my mm -hmm. position because I already volunteer, I have free buttons, March on Springfield. I already volunteer like 40 hours a week and I work in my job 40 hours a week. So I could just reverse it and not have my salary be on my paper as a way for it to extend its life a little bit longer. Um, I don't know, that's, that's one thing I think that might happen is that I figure out another way that we do the paper. Um, I hope we are and you know my team has, most of my staff, the average length of time they've been with me is 18 years. Hmm. Oh my god. Yeah. I mean <laughs> my assistant publisher has been with me 22 or 3 years. Um, my web person has been 20 years. My art director 17 years. I mean I have an incredibly dedicated loyal staff that some of them have given me decades of their lives. I am a loyal person mm -hmm. and I want to figure out a way that we can continue as long as we can. I want you to like work at a foundation or something, yeah, get like get in there, <laughs> and then get, that's what I think you that's should a great do. Idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I I don't know about me for in for in five years, but I I do think within City Bureau, I, part of what we're doing now and what I think will come to fruition in even earlier than five years is replicating the model in other spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so actually Daryl Holiday, who I've mentioned before, is in Detroit this weekend because nice. there is a, a cohort of people around WDET, the public radio there, who will want to do this kind of work. Um, so ideally, I hope that there's like a network of folks like City Bureau who've like taken what we've done and, and put their own like flavor of their area on mm -hmm. it. Um, and then there's a larger network amongst those those um, outlets, That's great. so that we guys, so that we can, we don't feel alone, you know. Because mm -hmm. I think there, I don't think that the four of us are unique by any means. I think there are others who want to do this kind of uh, community media, and I think it's a matter of finding them and sharing best practices. 
That's great. And, and DET is a, is a really good uh, public radio station, so to see that activity looking to happen yeah. with people involved in that station is, is, uh, is kind, of ex kind of exciting. I think it's a really exciting time, even though it still can feel kind of doomy and gloomy, but I think it feels gloomy for if you work at the Tribune or like if you work at the Sun-Times. And I think that the reality is like there's a lot of opportunities coming out of these moments of crises. And if you're, if you're willing to, to, you can find them if you're willing to. You know, that's a good point. It's, it's a strange, almost reversal of fortune in a way. I mean, like a generation or two ago, um, if, if, if you and I were talking, people in your, uh, in your, in your steads uh, might be looking secretly to have a job at a mainstream uh, paper. And if not, they would have picked you off. They would have offered you yeah. much more money. The, the, um, the historic publications that, that Tempest talked about at the beginning, many of them, be, you know, sort of hit troubled waters when big papers and big magazines said, gee, we can hire black folk now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and started after, the, after this, the activism of the 60s and 70s began to do that. Um, here, it's, 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 it's kind of different. I mean, it's, it's, um, I mean th these, these institutions may not necessarily go away unless, I mean, be for that reason, it could be another reason, foundations sure. don't step up, but, but um, you, let me, you, I'm not ask you directly, you probably don't, wouldn't want, if I gave you a job at the Tribune, you wouldn't take it, would you? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I also like never would have. I felt like Tracy, like that was not for me. Mm -hmm. Like I don't think that space was ever for me for a lot of reasons. I don't think they would have wanted me. Mm -hmm. And now, if they did, I don't care if you want. You know, like yeah, I don't yeah, actually yeah. care. But I mean, and I, I still think there. I think what's happening right now in the media ecosystem of Chicago is just that there is an opportunity for folks to to be honest about what they can offer. And I do think there are some things that the Tribune sometimes can still offer in terms of their distribution and things like that but it's they have to be willing to like humble themselves to know that they're never going to be what they once were mm -hmm. and that's just the reality of it and then that's okay because in some ways it makes you have to play nice with other folks mm. indeed indeed mm. tracy you know i right now consider four-year journalism court, court um, degrees malpractice yeah um first of all i think it should be a two-year degree yeah and yeah. i think that entrepreneurialism should be half of the core curriculum yeah. because we are more like musicians than we are doctors mm -hmm. and you have this conference is a good example you have to figure out a way to monetize and live especially if you're gonna raise a family you know I didn't have a kid um, so I didn't have those kind of costs so I was able to live close to the ground mm -hmm. um, and not everybody can and that shouldn't be a choice that people should have to make based mm -hmm. on their career so we need a whole remaking of what it is to be a journalist and, and places like City Bureau are things that should be funded immensely because they are the road to journalism now more so than a four year degree at Northwestern University. Um, I think that there is a place for journalism in mainstream institutions. I think that Journalism 101 should be a, a required course in a liberal arts degree, yeah. because we are all journalists now on Facebook and other yeah. media. So, so we need a rethinking of journalism is both larger and smaller. Yeah. Um, it's everywhere and it's niche, and we need to figure out a way to adapt to that. And and I think Andrea and her team, I think you replicating that in Detroit and a few other cities. Then the Ford Foundation and other ones maybe bring the millions of dollars. MacArthur Foundation's yeah. journalism program should be funding them to the tune of millions of dollars because the work they do is critical voices that are not getting heard and never have been really heard. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as a way of justifying that through you're giving money to the institutions that are serving those communities, but you're not, they're not being watchdogged by the journalists. Right. So if your money is of value to you and you're putting money into prisons or <laughs> prison reform like MacArthur, mm -hmm. you must have journalists covering that beat yeah. to keep those institutions accountable. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Andrew, do you want to take one, one last swipe at this? Oh, I was I was getting back on that funding thing. Some of the more radical thing, I don't think it's radical, but like the, I was like, you should just tax public officials like take money out of their salaries to pay for journalism too because <laughs> we are in theory we're like making them do their job right. mm -hmm. so really you know but anyway <laughs> <laughs> well yeah. um where are we at I think we, are we at our time or do we have to start singing songs now, right? Yeah. All right, well, um, in that case then, well, I guess we'll, we'll conclude a fantastic round of applause for our, uh, for our, our panel. Tracy, Tracy Bain, Andrea Hart. Thank you. And Tempest.